I was trying to think the other day, since we've been talking about, you know, since the Star Game, really, I've been thinking about games, you know, and I was thinking about what kind of game our show would be if our show was a game. And I just now realized it's Pokemon. It's, mm-hmm. uh, we're just <laughs> collecting these, like, weird little fascists. They're kind of cute, but they're also fucked up and murderous, you know, it's... <laughs> Not like yeah. Magic the Gathering or something? No, or? I think it's Pokemon. I think uh, I think you just got to catch them all. We'll just keep gotta collecting catch them. them all. And then we'll make them battle. <laughs> I got Vladika Nikolai. <laughs> 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 what sound does he make? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Tickles tummy. Aw. Yeah, you see, they're always... Yeah, they're just a little bit cute. But angry. here we're back um with uh boris fritz and ray uh yeah. the, the dream team hey. the the original uh tenipod crew the only tenipod you know, crew. you know when there was the um in the 90s when the yugoslav or serbia montenegro at the time the federal republic of yugoslavia's basketball That's team was segue. the competitor to uh to the dream team um they were called the european nightmare just... Understandably, understandably, yeah. 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 The Dream Team and the European Nightmare. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, they were legitimately, you know, mm. the American Dream Team. Of course, everybody knows, but the no. the European ones. Nightmare, was, however, the European Nightmare was was pretty good too. I mean, <laughs> fantastic. Americans would know, of course, Vlad the Divac and Vladdy Divac. Uh, they competed in the in, in the '96 Olympics in the finals and lost by a pretty significant margin, but oh, it was really? still like it was a. Uh, Hmm. It was an honorable defeat. Well, glorious in so, defeat. So yeah. very much a Serbian thing. Very much yeah, a Yugoslav exactly. thing. They celebrated yeah. the loss. You know, that was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a great segue then. So uh, speaking of that, we're going we're gonna to be chatting about uh, Serbian fascism again. Yeah, I mean, we already did one episode on like Yugoslav and Serbian fascism in the 20s and 30s. And this is a sort of like uh, an additional like uh, episode uh, for our premium listeners about some important things that we didn't mention that are pretty important. Uh, but, I mean, you can get the picture even without it, but it's, it's useful. top secret premium information. Yeah. So, I mean, mostly today I'll talk about um, a guy called Nikolai Velimirovic, who was an Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox bishop and who was canonized as a saint in 2003 by the Serbian church. Oh, he must be a great guy. Yeah, an awesome guy. I mean, he he was a very interesting uh, guy in some ways. Uh, uh, a total weirdo like we used to on this podcast. <laughs> um, with some, like, surprising things about him. Um, I think a lot of, like, Serbian Orthodox people would be surprised if they knew more about him, like, and his interests. So, I mean, uh, Nikolai was born as Nikola Vilimirovic in 1881 and he died in the in the US in um, the 50s I think in 56 and he was born in Serbia in some small village and it's interesting because he of course um, uh, you can become a, a bishop uh, in orthodox churches only if you are a monk so the bishops and the higher ups in the the church hierarchy are recruited from the monks so he obviously became a monk when he was 29 years old, which was, I think, around 1910. And he took the name Nikolai, um, which is a more archaic version of his own name, Nikola, which is, I think, also also a bit indicative. I think it says a bit about how, because, um, I mean, you are supposed to kind of embrace a different identity when you become a monk, uh, or usually yeah, okay. uh, to take the name so of some... What he added Sorry? a J, yeah, he added a J. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. yeah, like you, you're supposed to do, uh, adopt the name of a saint that you like or something that's important <laughs> to you or something like this. And he, I think, he didn't really didn't want to change his name. He wanted to remain Nikola. You know, he 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 had an idea that he's an important guy. It's and, a lot of great Nicolas. Yeah, so he became Nikola. 
Um, he uh, became kind of well known um, during the First World War, maybe shortly even before that, uh, because he he was um, an educated priest and then a monk, which was uh, in Serbia and at the time kind of an unusual thing. Um, he was not only educated, he was educated in the West. So I think he studied actually at the Oxford University for a time, maybe some mm-hmm. other foreign universities. He he read philosophy and he was also kind of a, he had the image of being a modernist. Um, so the liberals and the like Western like oriented people in Serbia really liked him at the time. They thought, mm-hmm. okay, this is a kind of priest that we need. He's the future of the Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, he spoke foreign languages, and so during the war, uh, the First World War, he got a like he was on a kind of diplomatic propaganda mission for the Serbian government in the UK. He um, yeah he did some pro-Serbian propaganda and made connections with influential people in, in the United Kingdom. He was quite successful at that, so people in Serbia liked him. Uh, he became quite well known, and he had like what what was interesting that at the time he had the image of someone who's very close to Western Christians, like especially to various Protestant churches that he was close to, and especially the Anglican Church. He even had like supposedly the, like the Archbishop of Canterbury was his friend. And That's he, just because they drink. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there was some connection between the Anglicans and the Orthodox. Like there was some even. Apparently, at some historical period in the 20th century, there was even some uh, negotiations about unifying the two churches. Because, Hmm. I mean, uh, and the Anglicans are quite, I mean, they're basically the Catholic church in many ways. Like, they're different from from the Protestants. Yeah, I can see the connection, though, because they're also... They just didn't uh, want to take take no shit from the Pope. Which is basically... It's a monarchist church. It's very orthodox in that way. I think orthodoxy is kind of inherently monarchistic, isn't it? Whereas, like, Catholicism uh, well, had this sort of imperial heritage. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, yeah, in that way, it's a national church, monarchist, but a very old-fashioned kind of um, similar to Catholics and also to Orthodox in some way. And, and so the the bishop, who can, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for example, he wrote a foreword for one of uh, Nikolai's books at the time and so on. Um, and when, uh, after the war, when he... Um, so, uh, but okay, I forgot something. So, while he was in the UK during the war, he had some interesting company. For example, one of his close friends was a guy called Dmitry Mitrinovich, who was a guy from uh, Herzegovina, actually, mm-hmm. close to young Bosnia that we mentioned a lot of times, um, a bit older than them, but very inf- kind of a part of their circle, very influential guy but he was a real weirdo and he 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 lived in the UK and he had like the this image of being a kind of an uh, occultist or even a person like like with some uh, supernatural abilities even or like a bit of a guru cool. um, and he he uh, he was one of the original new agers he even had a like in the 30s he had a a, a magazine and a movement which was called new age Ah, and he was, uh, yeah, very inf- uh, influenced by um, anthroposophy, theosophy, and such currents, also like Gurdjieff. But he ca- had he- ambition of having his own kind of uh, version of that, basically. And so Nikolai was his friend, and they were like um, doing a lot of things together at the time. Um, and you can see those kinds of influences in Nikolai, even though now he's uh, like well uh, respected by. Or, like Orthodox Christian fundamentalist. I mean, he was quite um, Orthodox heretical. Christian fundamentalists who, of mm. course, hate the occult, but also don't like Protestants. Yeah. Uh. yeah. <laughs> so he was like uh, successful at this mission in the UK, and after the war, he returned to Yugoslavia, or what was now Yugoslavia before it was Serbia. Now it was Yugoslavia, and um, he because. He did a great job. People liked him. Uh, he became uh, a bishop um, in the 20s. I'm not sure exactly when. I think maybe actually in 1920, exactly. He became a bishop of Ohrid, which is a city in Macedonia today. Um, was, he still like, little... uh, was he still an occultist at the time? Like, was he no, no, no. Time, I mean, uh, well, I mean, this influence, I think, remained. Uh, you, you, uh, but he had a change. 
So uh, about the time when he became a bishop, this is what all the historians said, he became a more orthodox, orthodox Christian and quite conservative. Orthodoxer, even orthodoxer. Yeah, an orthodoxer. <laughs> So um, he became quite conservative and very anti-Western, which is not uh, the, like the opposite of his image until that uh, right. time. Uh, so he began to develop his own thoughts. I mean, very derivative, I would say, um, influenced by other writers. He read a lot of Nietzsche. He imagined that he like wrote an orthodox response to the idea of the Ubermensch. Uh, so he oh. wrote... Um, some kind of a book about that. What is that um, response? Um, I, I didn't go too much into it, but he called it like a, so in the Serbo Croatian, the Ubermensch would be Nadchoek, and he had this term which he used, Svechoek. So, <laughs> but I. I the ev- every man? <laughs> or, the or normal the guy. man, something. Oh, yeah, man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. I, I'm not capable okay. of getting into that. Um, <laughs> or willing, it sounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but he, he, so, I mean, when we talk about people like this, who have these mystical beliefs and are nationalist and fascist, you can't really pin them down completely because they're very inconsistent. Slip. So you will see that now how he changes his opinion quite often. Um, but, uh, at the time he had this idea, uh, he started developing idea like anti-Western ideas. Um, and the idea is how, for example, the Serbs and the Balkans are a specific cultural, civilizational, and national entity, different from the West. La la. Um, he also, I mean, he was quite clearly influenced by um, a lot of, I mean, uh, contradictory, but like Western thinkers of the time, like Oswald Spengler mm-hmm. and similar figures which were all close to fascism of the time, but more kind of the so-called intellectual wing of it. The, the, what uh, we mentioned. Fancy Nazis. Fancy pan- Nazis, like the, yeah. the so-called conservative revolutionaries and such people. Um, and he adopted a lot of the racist theories and terminology. So he would say that the Serbs are like God's children and people oh, okay. of the Aryan race. So sure. he would often use this term. Uh, Aryan to describe when, Serbs. When, when did he start using the term Aryan? I'm, I'm curious. I mean, is um... mm, I think for sure he used it in the 30s, possibly already in the 20s. I mm-hmm. mean, I know that his friend Dmitry Mitrinovich used it in the 20s. Mm-hmm. He de- he gave it a bit uh, different uh, meaning than he, like Adolf Hitler did. A more kind of new agey meaning to it. But yeah, they were using this term quite early. I think in the 20s, probably. And so he would. Um, he, he also thought that the the Serbs have the destiny to be the main carriers of the Christian faith in the world. Um, a lot of Ambitious. this is informed by like Spengler, and also I think by uh, you can see even in this like more orthodoxy phase that he had the, the influence of things like anthroposophy. I would say because. Um, there, there was this Spengler's idea about the decline of the Western civilization, and then some added to it that the next civilization will be the Slavic civilization. So uh-huh. one of these people who believed in this was the Rudolf Steiner, the guy who founded Anthroposophy, which mm-hmm. um, was uh, like uh, an offshoot of Theosophy, like weirdo Western occult movements. So I think he, like Nikolai, adopted this idea of the coming Slavic civilization. I think sometimes they even point that like it will come in the 22nd century or something like uh-huh, this, okay. the, the, when the, well, the world will be dominated by the Slavic civilization. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not with Russia's uh, <laughs> yeah. alcohol problem and <laughs> declining population. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the Slavic soul. Maybe that's one of the characteristics of the Slavic civilization. Everyone will be in a permanent trance from what or something. Rakia. Self-destruction. And, you know. Sounds all right. So, he, um, so, for example, he would say things like, in our blood, we, the Serbs, are Aryan, our last name is Slavic, and our name is Serbian, and our heart and spirit are Christian. Um, so, this is interesting. So, he doesn't like the West. But he also says things like that the Serbs and Slavs were the keepers, like the guards of the European gates and defended Europe from tribes of inferior race and religion. And they, um, uh, in that way, 
enabled Europe to prosper and develop. So, uh, like, in a way, I mean, Serbs are responsible for this. But what, which, uh, I'm sorry, which inferior races were they protecting them from? Because, like, to the West, okay, fine, like, everybody's still practically, like, cavemen. They just have castles, you know? But, like, to the East, they've got fucking science and astronomy and, like... Exactly. You know, <laughs> like, which... But, who were they defending against? Of course, but uh, this is also, you will see, I said that he's very contradictory. So you, you uh-huh, will see these okay. contradictions very soon. Because he also hates the West, you know. So in a way, right. he says that the Serbs are responsible for West being the dominant civilization because they, de- like, defended it from, like, even worse civilizations. And it's like, the but the West is also the worst civilization? I don't know. That, of course, what? The worst, right. the even worse being the Ottoman Empire, right? Probably, Presumably. yes. Uh, but <laughs> okay. he says that the Serbs and Slavs did that through centuries. And he doesn't talk only about Serbs, but also about Slavs in general. So this would imply, in my opinion, that, you know, Russians had wars with, I don't know, Mongols or something like this. Maybe that also counts. But you will see that there are, like, deep contradictions here very soon. Um, so... And of course, at the same time, he develops uh, very anti-Semitic thoughts. Uh, so when he talks about the, like, you know, the, the 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 decadence of the Western civilization, he, he really what he talks about is the, the, the Jewish influence on the Western civilization. And um, I mean, in this, you, we can see how you know how these a lot of these ideas never really change. Like they right. really. Uh, say, like, because he even uses like the, I mean, you can s- completely see this, uh, how uh, the other name for this could be, you know, cultural Marxism or something like right. this. Yeah. And they even use the term like the, um, I think I will mention that specifically later. They use the term cultural Bolshevism, like they uh-huh. use this in the 30s. Uh, and they say that this is the worst uh, aspect of Marxism, the most destructive one. So uh, Nikolai says that the behind modernism and secularism is the um, the satanic conspiracy of the Jews. So uh, they also want to bring the their Messiah to the, the throne of Christ. This is their plan. Do you think? Um, I mean, I mean, this is just speculation, but he spent some time studying in Russia. Yeah, and this sounds very much like yes. what the Russian kind of. Currents yes. in the Russian churches, which I have mean, always been only... deeply anti-Semitic and more anti-Semitic than, say, more of the... I mean, like, other Orthodox churches are not nearly as anti-Semitic as the Russian uh, one, That's totally true. And not only did he spend the time in Russia, a lot of Russians spend a lot of time in Yugoslavia, in Belgrade, yes. because they were like the white Russians, anti-communist ones, who moved to Serbia, a lot of them in Yugoslavia. And not only that, but they started their own autonomous church, which is the Russian mm. Orthodox Church outside of Russia, which is a very conservative, anti-Semitic church, um, which was started in 1921 in Serbia, in the town of Sremski Kalovci. Okay. So uh, he was close to these circles. And of course, a lot of these anti-Semitic things, I think, are something that they shared and influenced each other, uh, for sure. Um so, I mean, so, the, okay, uh, an interesting thing happened to Nikolai in 1935, and uh, this was that he got a medal from Adolf Hitler. Uh, so he, uh, yeah. I don't know what to say. I mean, it's a great honor. Yeah. I mean, uh, he officially got it because he was, I said, a, a bishop in Macedonia. He um, he renovated a, a, a German war cemetery from the First World War there. Uh-huh. And this is the official reason why he got it. Uh, but obviously, I mean... Look, there apart- are worse ways to get a medal from Hitler. I'll yeah. say that. <laughs> but I mean, obviously, the things that he was saying were very close to, you know, the ideology of Nazism. So I think that was... Not only that I think, but actually there are like... I will mention even some very concrete proof that this was the case. And this is the reason why he got the medal. Okay. So when talking about uh, Nikolai Vladimirovich and his fascist ideas, um, there are a few things that we can talk about it. So one is that the, the, what I already started to talk about, which is like Nikolai's own kind of weird ideas about Serb Slavs um, and so uh, racism and Aryanism and so on. Uh, the, the other would be these connections with Western 
uh, fascist ideas and even the Nazi regime uh, in some way. Um, mm -hmm. And then another would be uh, his close relationship with uh, the guy we already covered called Dmitry Ljotic and his fascist movement called Zbor. So they, yeah, he, he was, was that not sad dork that nobody liked, if you remember. Yes. Yes. So they were very close to each other, uh, politically and like spiritually. Makes um, sense. They were both dorks for Jesus. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, but it's interesting because this is like now people who support uh, Nikolai they deny that he was a they deny that he was a follower of Ljotic, for example. But this is interesting because. Um, uh, uh, Nikolai denied it as well, but he denied it I in mean, a very interesting... I mean, everybody denied it eventually. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. but he, he denied it in a very interesting way. He he did an interview in 1953 when he was living in the US already. It was like three years before he died, one, maybe his last interview. And then the, the, the interviewer asked him, like, what do you say to these people who say that you were Ljotic's follower and that you were a fascist? And he says, like, well, that's ridiculous because Ljotic was my follower. Like, Ooh, um, damn. <laughs> And he says, like, uh, I was the, like, uh, eminence Greece of the, uh, yeah, the of Zbor yeah. and of uh, the Christian nationalism in Serbia, which <laughs> is a code word for fascism, basically. Yeah. So he sees he, them. He, yeah. Well, what do you think? Does he get to make that claim? Uh, I would say that there is a... Uh, it, it, I mean, he was definitely one of the most important people. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. And we can see that in... Um, few ways like um that i will try to explain somehow um uh, so uh i mean just to finish this connection with ljotic he he was obviously very close to them he, when I, I mentioned that ljotic was um supposed to be arrested in, in 1940 and then he like escaped and at the time uh, bishop nikola vilimirovic he wrote uh, like a protest letter to the government in support of ljotic and such things Hmm. And when when Ljotic died, he gave uh, a speech at Ljotic's funeral. This was all during the war in Slovenia when they were like trying to regroup uh, nationalist fascist forces there. And he gave uh, a speech at the funeral of Ljotic and he said very complimentary things about Ljotic, how he was um, the only true Christian politician that we ever had and things like this. Okay. And uh, and a great guy. Um, sure. Yeah, <laughs> like to have a beer with them. <laughs> they had like one important political difference, uh, and this is that uh, I mentioned in the previous episode that there was a um, uh, when the Yugoslav government signed the tripartite. Is that how do you call it? Tripartite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tripartite. Yeah. Uh, a pact that there was a protest on the twenty seventh of March in forty one. And also a coup d'état as a result of that. Um, uh, and this is basically the, the trigger for the German invasion of Yugoslavia and the whole breakup of it. So yeah. Ljotic was obviously very much against these protests, against the signing of the pact. But interestingly enough, Vilimirovic was not only for it, he was one of the... He, he participated in organizing the protests. Yeah, uh, that is weird. That's I mean, um, he had his own ideas. So, I mean... Um, uh, like it's interesting because the church and the communist party were like two of I'm the sorry, like I'm just, most. I'm staring at this guy's face right now as you say that. Just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> looking at him, staring back at me. He's holding like a medallion. He's got this like long beard and this sort of like I don't know. Yeah, he's a pretty of, wild, wild looking dude. Yeah, yeah. let uh, me invite you inside. Kind of stare, you know. I mean, you can see how he's much more uh, charismatic than Ljotic, for example. Yeah, he's got his oh, own yeah, ideas. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Ljotic is a Ljotic is weird and a different like. He's yeah. like mousy and, you know. Yeah, yeah. This guy um, looks like an actual wizard. Yes, straight yeah. up. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I mean, it's interesting because these, like, um, the protest uh, against the signing of the pact with the Axis forces by Yugoslavia, the, like, the main organizers of it was the Communist Party, but also the Serbian church. Uh, so, I mean, this shows you, okay, things are more complicated than you usually expect them to be. Right. I mean, so even like someone that I believe was, who was a fascist and who had nice things to say about Hitler, like Vilimirovic, he was against that, for example. I mean, this is because we're dealing with nationalists, so they have their own different logics. Sure, and, you know, yeah, right. and opposing, like you can have conflicts between 
different fascisms, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think we already mentioned that not only that, but you in different, in some other countries, you had fascists who were a part of the resistance against the Nazis, you know, like in mm -hmm. Poland or in France or like, so this is not something very well, contradictory. We also know that, you know, given that fascists kill each other at a great rate, you know, they, the only people they hate more than the Jews are each other. So yeah, yeah, and, and of course, Hitler and Mussolini themselves famously did yeah, not get exactly. along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so uh, this was the big difference between Ljotic and Vilimirovic. But in the end of the war, they like they met up and were close again. But uh, for this reason, during the occupation, most of the time, Vilimir Nikola Vilimirovic was like interned by the Nazis. He was like basically in house arrest in uh, two different monasteries. Um, and in the end of the war, they um, they moved him to Dachau which is today used uh, by his defenders to say how he was not a fascist or anti-Semite because he was in Dachau. There were a few, uh, though, Serbian proto-fascists that ended up in Dachau, though. Well, yeah. because the, Dachau was also primarily for political prisoners. Yeah, right. I, mean, I mean, its function before the war was for political prisoners, and gen then during the war it had a separate section just for political prisoners and usually pretty high-ranking ones. Yeah. I mean, he was in this section of like the, the, the like honored prisoners. So he had oh, like. Oh, okay. I mean, he like had, he wasn't in there with like the Jews, no. like starving. And yeah, yeah, not at all. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're not a fascist. It means you're a fascist and a loser. Mm. He w had quite good conditions there. He was there with like Catholic bishops there. Uh, and, uh, and he was there less than three months. So, right. and then he was, um, uh, they let him go and they sent him to. Slovenia, where, I, as I said already, the, these like fascist Serbian Yugoslav forces were gathering, trying to uh, organize some kind of a counteroffensive to the partisans, um, and all the different ones, right? So, yeah. in Slovenia at the time, you had the Ljotic no. crew from from Serbia, you had Ustasha's from Croatia, yeah. you had. The Slovenian Domobranci. Chetniks. Uh, and Chetniks and everybody kind of crammed in one. You even had like some Russian like anti-communist forces there. Yeah. Like the guy who was like, like not only like the old one, like the, the white Russians, but there was even this like, I think Vlasov, who was like a Red Army general who then switched sides, I think. Um, so he was wow. there like, and he had negotiations with Ljotic about uniting their forces. And then Ljotic died because he, in a car accident, uh, so <laughs> that, that didn't happen. <laughs> Shitty. <Yeah. laughs> Not a very glorious way to go. And everybody else is going out no. in a blaze of like no, gunfire. It's, it's so Ljotic though, car. isn't it? It's so yeah. him. But what, what, what's interesting that, uh, I mean, uh, while uh, uh, Velimirovic was in Dachau, that's also the time when he wrote his worst anti-Semitic uh, texts. Like, he, like, really kind of hardcore anti-Semitic texts saying how, you know, the Jews are really behind the war. It's a war against Christian civilization. Mm -hmm. They are also behind communism and capitalism and democracy. They want to destroy the Western civilization and, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, so, it's an old song. Yeah, that's his yeah. experience from, you know, the concentration camp. Um, and um, <laughs> so he gets, yeah. well, like literally yeah, he gets me meters away from him. They were just yeah, yeah. killing Jews. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying he gets arrested by Nazis and blames the Jews. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so uh, and uh, so after the war, when this effort to uh, like do a counteroffensive against the, 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 the communists didn't work, he went to live in the United States and he lived in a Serbian. Mo he was apparently quite depressed. He lived in a, a monastery in Illinois, somewhere in Libertyville, where he yeah, died. Uh, yeah. Libertyville, Illinois, is um, it's like a suburb of Chicago, but it's where after World War II, the largest contingent of like Serbian nationalists ended up. They founded a major monastery there, which is named after one of the yeah. major medieval Serbian monasteries in Kosovo. And it's kind of, it's still kind of the heartland of like Chetniks in America is mm -hmm. Libertyville, Illinois. Uh, just a question though. I have on Wikipedia here, it says he died in South Canaan, Pennsylvania on the border of New York. Uh, right. Well, there is um, actually, there's a, yeah, there's a major like Orthodox a Russian Orthodox seminary there. Yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. I think with the, the, the biggest seminary in the U.S. Uh, or Maybe he lived in Libertyville and Portland. he was buried there, I think. Yeah. Okay. And then in um, 91, his remains were like moved to Serbia. And in 2003, the Serbian church canonized him as a, as a saint. Um, but I want to 
move us now a little bit to back in time uh, to the period <laughs> when he <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when he came that. back to Yugoslavia after the war so he when he came a, uh, became a bishop uh, like at the time there was like an autonomous kind of movement by orthodox weirdos like usually um, a lot of them quite poor people peasants was that their name? The Autonomous Movement of Orthodox Weirdos? Almost, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, they, they were officially called uh, the, like the National Christian Community. That's about um, the same. Yeah, okay. But uh, people know them as Bogomolci or Bogomoljački Pokret. It was the name that was given to them. So literally that means like something like prayers or like God prayers literally or like worshippers. Worshippers, Patriot yeah. prayer. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a it's um, it is a pejorative term in some way, like because I mean um, Serbian Orthodox nationalists n- now they want to say how you know uh, Serbs are not so religious or good Christians because of the bad influence of communism mm-hmm. during Yugoslavia, but the the truth is that Serbs were never that like devout religious people really and um so when someone was uh, like that then they would call him like call them like pejorative names the names and uh-huh. this bogomolci is a, a name like it's like you can translate it as like jesus freaks or something yeah okay like, jesus yeah. freaks uh, well, yeah. Lisa, they All weren't right. they weren't religious necessarily to the strict doctrines of the church no because this is a, yeah. because like folk beliefs were always kind of the most prominent yeah. like type of belief that you'd have in in serbia for yeah. sure so this is and like a, a constant yeah. struggle between them trying to root out like these pagan leftovers and and this that and the other thing. Uh, yeah, from, Ray, like, you told me a a little story I think about maybe the most recent election of a patriarch in Serbia. Maybe mm-hmm. he, something about how he wasn't he lost a lot of popularity because he tried to ban some food or something. What was that story? I uh, no, no. The, the, the there was a guy who was who wasn't elected. He wanted to be a patriarch, but he he didn't get enough votes. Or actually, okay, maybe the because it, how they uh, so the patriarch is the head of the Serbian Orthodox Church and the, the bishops, universal head. Yes, and the, uh, the bishops choose him between themselves. But how they do it is like they they vote uh, a few guys in, and then the Holy Spirit decides who will become the patriarch. So oh, they, they okay. basically put the names in like the Bible or something, right? That's foolproof. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he was one of the three guys who was voted in, and then the like the Holy Spirit didn't choose him. Oh. Uh, but he, yeah, he, he, he was. Um, there is like a sausage festival somewhere in Serbia <laughs> and uh, some little town, and it was like uh, one year. It was at the time of the, like the fast, like the big one. Yeah. So he was like um, scandalized that uh, like they're doing a sausage festival in this period. So he just holy like, day. Yeah. Uh, like they asked, he asked them like to postpone or stop, and they were like, Whoa, "What the fuck, you know?" Like because like um, like I, uh, all of these Serbs there would probably say they are very orthodox, but they never yeah, right. consider like not eating sausages. Well, they have priorities right, because because yeah. in, in Orthodox yeah. Lent or generally yeah. when you fast, but especially in Lent is the longest period. Mm. They're not allowed to eat any meat or dairy or anything. So it's yeah. like you know, I, I think in the Catholic Church. They they can't on what like Fridays or something. It's or? pretty lax. I mean, yeah, no meat on Fridays kind of thing. There's other rules, but but uh, in the Orthodox yeah. Church, they're not allowed to eat like animal products. Period. I think for Wednesdays the entirety too, right? of Lent, except for fish. But yeah, right. Other than yeah. that, so, like no yeah. milk, you know, whatever. So serves like that kind of Orthodox kind of not yeah. really. You know, they they all say they are, but uh, when take it comes away to, my sausage fest. Yeah, the limits yeah. meat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm exactly as Orthodox as I am hungry. So, but this movement of like this uh, Bogomolci that I mentioned, or Jesus freaks, they were like not that. They were very serious and they were very like um, ascetical. Is that how you say? Yeah. As- oh, how do you say that? Ascetic. ascetic. It's a ascetic. fucking yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fuck that. I think it's yeah. ascetic. Uh, You're not ascetic. supposed to say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. But they they were also because they were quite like autonomous, like were like organized by these zealots. Um, they were also kind of the church. Kind of didn't like them. They were very skeptical of them. Um, and they also did things that were not very orthodox. Like they were like preaching publicly in the streets. They had their own oh, leaders. Like, that, like Jesus. Yeah. Like the person they worship. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were not uh, necessarily priests, many of their leaders. So they were. the church didn't know what to do with them. They're like a lot of people who are enthusiastic about religion and they call themselves orthodox. 
but like they're kind of weird. This is so, this is um, a very this is a very current analog to this in the U.S. and that's in mm-hmm. like evangelical Catholic movements. Okay. Like it, there was a lot of uh, controversy about that for a really long time, and then I think uh, who who settled it? I think. Uh, Maybe Benedict did stepped in and said, "Like, I guess it's kind of cool. We're losing members. Mm. Don't leave us." Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, uh, there are, like I read some reports from they had like many meetings, conferences in different towns in Serbia and also other parts of Yugoslavia. And then you like some journalists would describe these people in the twenties. So there is like one guy. Uh, I mean, they, they were usually very. Um, poor peasants but they were also like uh, people coming from the so-called middle class or whatever that means but like for example there is this guy that the, the reporters describe who they call like dr arsovich so he supposedly has two phds that he okay. like got somewhere in the west something sorry like i'm this. picturing just like a california sun-baked like long-haired dude <laughs> with like crazy sunglasses exactly inside. Yeah. that's okay. how he looks <laughs> He he looks very like uh, dirty, and uh, he he wears uh, like a priest's robe. He's, he's totally, a dolphin like, scientist. Old. Yeah, he's not a priest, but he's wearing uh, he's dressed as like a priest. And, like he, he wears a robe that's very dirty and fucked up and torn down, and he like uh, barely doesn't uh, he doesn't almost eat. He eats like yeah, um, he's the sparrow only once per day, a little bit of bread and onions for some reason. So this uh, is his but diet. bread and onions is classic. Come on, yeah. <laughs> But he only eats that. It's just lunch. Um, <laughs> That's a working man's lunch. So, um, and there were also like some rumors. I can't find too much about it. They were also like into, they were like occulty things about him. Like some of them like uh, uh, communicate with spirits or something like this. So the church was like, okay, fuck that. We need to control this. So there is this other, there is this other weirdo, this Nikolai who just became a bishop. So maybe we can appoint him to be the head of this movement for us and kind of organize it the more the way we more like it, you know, because he's also weird and you know he's a, he's a freak uh, kind of annoying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's Perfect. what they he's did. Weird, this, but he's legit too at yeah. the same time. Huh? <laughs> so this is how Nikolai Vilimirovic became the head of this movement, and what he did when he became the head, he started, of course, of infusing it with his ideas. And so they, he organized, he made a more proper movement out of it. Uh, they started a publishing like a division. They published, an, like until the start of the first, uh, second world war, they published a hundred books. And also they had like a newspaper uh, where he like had his friends work. Uh, and so All right, he, get it done. Uh, yeah, so he, they, him and his friends, uh, the priests who were like part of his circle, they started writing texts against, you know, democracy, capitalism, and Marxism, Bolshevism, Okay, uh, so everything, everything Jewish. Yeah, well, yeah. and uh, <laughs> not only that, they started, um, they, ta- they started publishing like uh, excerpts of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Of course. Damn. I was waiting okay. for it. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, oh, there you can also see the influence of the Russian church in Yugoslavia, I think. Uh, and interestingly enough, they, uh, this movement, uh, when Nikolai Vladimirovich took it un- under his wing, they also published texts by Henry Ford. Oh, so makes, um, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yep, that guy, yeah, yep. garbage, garbage person. Yep. So uh, at some point, um, there was almost a kind of a merger between this mo- movement and uh, Ljotić Zbor. So a lot of the leaders of the movement joined Zbor, uh, the fascist organization headed by Dmitry Ljotić. And uh, not only that, but there was a, like, he, he uh, Nikolai Vilimirovich had a, a lieutenant, which was a guy similar to him called uh, Dmitry Naidanovich. He was a priest, but he was also, like, a priest who also had a PhD, like, in German philosophy, like, in, that he did in Germany. He wrote a PhD about Fichte, and he was, like, a guy who was very much into Oswald Spengler and those kind of things. So... Nikola Vilimirovich basically ordered this guy, who was his deputy, to become the member of Ljotić Zbor. And he did, and he was like one of the leaders of it. Um, so in that sense, I think he's right when he says that he was like this, the influence from the shadows. You know, he didn't want to join Zbor because right. he said like he, he thought he was like better than them in a way, but he wanted to be a, a, a leader of it from the shadow by making his body join it. Uh-huh. But that's uh, also, I think, um, yeah, mm. church church figures don't traditionally join political parties, right? They're they're yeah. not really they're not supposed to. They're not allowed to. Yeah, but the Zbor but had they do to kind yeah. of wield their influence. Then 
from that side. The thing was that they were not a political party. That that was their whole thing. So right, they, they were a movement. Right? Yeah. So this was like um, uh, Zbor had uh, their thing was that they were like against political parties and they were like all national movement of the people for an integral you know, uh, organic state. So this was like an excuse for a lot of priests to become a member of it because it was like not a, it was not a particular thing, you know, it was like an all people's idea, uh, you know. So a lot of priests did join it mm-hmm. uh, or were close to it. Um, though, although I'm sure, you know, it's one thing for a priest to join. It's another mm-hmm. thing for a bishop, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I mean, yeah, but I mean, this is why I mentioned early how he almost didn't change his name when he became a monk. I think he was like, this guy was, didn't want to be a follower or anyone, you know, he was like very much into himself and, um, you know, and it worked. They like, uh, he's a saint since 2003. I don't know why exactly, but um, he is. Uh, I mean, uh, so the the Serbian theologians all have to say how he's the best ever, but I read some like uh, opinions by some other theologians, and they say like there's really nothing special there, like theology wise. Like he's he was mostly, just a Nazi. I mean, like a fascist, like mostly like very redundant, and also a lot of this mystical nationalist stuff. Mostly, mm-hmm. you know, he's not a scholar really. He wrote a lot, but it's mostly just his bullshit. You know. Um, <laughs> he sounds a lot like some other people we cover on this show. It's just he he made yeah. it somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we can see how Nikola Vladimirovich, why he thought of himself as a kind of eminence Greece of um, Christian nationalism in Yugoslavia and Serbia, which I think is a code word fa- code word for fascism, because he was a he was a bishop. Then he took hold of a independent movement of religious, mostly poor, like, peasants, and kind Not of... really into anime for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and All directed the it in a, Yeah. In the the, 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 the the direction he thought was proper. And then also he, like, ordered his lieutenants and close people to join the main fascist organization, and then they become prominent people inside of it, and uh, the leaders of it. And there was also an, another component... And that's that he tried to like so so he had connections with the fascist movement, which had a lot of youth in it. He had connections with like poor, uneducated, um, uh, religious people in the Bogomolci pocket, and then there, there was a third component, and this is that he had connections with intellectuals, and he was trying mm-hmm. to develop his own ideology. Um, did, and did, did he, you find sorry to interrupt? Mm-hmm. But did you find anything that he said about Bakunin by chance? No, no. <laughs> because there's like there's some, you know. I mean, he has a, he wrote here. a lot of stuff, so it's quite possible that he at some point said something. That'd be interesting. Um, but so he named so this nationalist ideology. He named it Svetosavsky nationalism, or I mean, um, Saint Sava nationalism, also shortened like Svetosavlje, which you can mm, maybe translate Saint Savaism, Saint Savaism, <laughs> or I Saint Savahood, or something. I don't yeah. know. Um, so I, I, earlier I mentioned this idea of the Serbian nationalists have that Saint Sava, who was a, a, like an aristocrat who lived in the 12th and the 13th century, and he was a prince of the, the ruling family, who then became a monk and a bishop, and he was the founder of the the autonomous church in this area, which was not called at the time Serbian Orthodox Church, but Serbs like to pretend that it was called like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so because he did that, uh, they see him as a founder, like one of the founders of the Serbian nation. And uh, Nikola Velimirovic and people like him specifically see him as like the founder of the Serbian nation uh, because he did the most important thing, and that is like he started the national religious organization, the National Church, which is for right. Nikola Milovic like the foundational thing for any nationalism and national project. So, um, of course, this doesn't make any sense because the whole idea of nationality and nation state didn't exist at the time when San Sava lived, and that's not what he did. But there is not a lot of, like, I mean, he lived uh, like 700 years ago, and there's not so many, much information about him. So, Nikola Velimirovic and his guys had a lot of room to improvise. So right. when you read their ideological text about him, it's like, you know, they they talk about 
the, the soul of Saint Saba and what his intimate thoughts were, and you know things like that. So <laughs> obviously, something that they Which couldn't... Is literally just made up. Yes. Right? I mean, there's um, so um, Saint Saba inter- fanfic. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because he's aware of a problem. Like, he's a a nationalist who's uh, very against uh, modernity. But on on some level, he understands that nationalism is a modern project. So this is a problem. And he overrides that problem by saying, but Sveti Sava, like the sense Sava, he was the original nationalist. He was the first nationalist. (laughs) He invented nationalism. It wasn't a real nationalism 700 years ago. Right. Not like these Jacobins who were like secular against the church and anti-Christian. Right. Uh, but that yeah, was the original nationalism, which is the only true one. And that's the one that's based on a national religious organization, um, which is the only proper way to do it. Uh, so he basically says we were the original nationalists and not these French assholes. Um, and... Um, not only uh, that, but I mean, this is now where there are also some weird and contradictory uh, things uh, uh, appear that I mentioned. Because earlier I said he w- that he said these more kind of classical um, European things, how you know Serbs or Slavs were the 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 guards of the gates of Europe against people of inferior race and religion and so on. But now he says different things. He says how. The Saint Sava was a very unique and specific individual, and he, um, in himself, had a characteristic that Nikola Vilimirovich calls the Asian capability. Hmm. And what? Yeah, the Asian, okay, I see. This is um, what did yeah. Marx call it? Uh, the, the capitalism and the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it's yeah. quite different from that. <laughs> uh, this is the um, uh, this is the. Um, the capability to deify oneself in a sense of completely negating your own ego so that uh, the in a man only God lives uh, inside of the man. So this is what he calls the Asian capability. And he says that uh, Saint Sava is one of the, one in the line of such holy, like godly men that Asia gave to humanity. Uh, I mean, he, uh, in some texts, he completely openly uh, compare Saint Sava to Buddha, like, um, and there are like some like uh, similarities between them because they were both like both uh, aristocrats who kind of gave up on their like um, class in some way. Saint Sava did, but I mean, when he became a monk, so this is like uh, one similarity between them that Vilimirovich insists on. Um, so this is uh, you know interesting. Now uh, I think at the time. Um, uh, because there was a lot of um, Russian emigres living in Serbia and Yugoslavia and Belgrade specifically, and some like who were anti-Bolshevik Russians who came to live there, and some of them were members of this weird intellectual current which was called um, Eurasianism, which we'll have to talk about at some point. Yeah. Um, but some of these people they believe they they value uh, like um, uh, Russia as a Eurasian civilization, and they value the contribution of Asian civilizations to the development of Russian statehood. Also, like, for example, specifically Mongolia and Genghis Khan. Uh, So one of these people who was into that lived in Belgrade, and he uh, published a book in Belgrade about Genghis Khan, Khan, which was like a very uh, pro-Genghis Khan book. Uh, So I think this partially influenced uh, Nikolai Vlimirovich as well. And, um, and at the same time, uh, in this white emigre mm-hmm. community, there was a, a large number of Kalmyk yeah. Buddhists yes. who settled primarily in Belgrade, but also in some other places in smaller numbers. Yeah. But in in Belgrade, they built the first Buddhist pagoda in in Europe, mm-hmm. in Europe outside of Russia, because yeah. actually Kalmykia is it's technically in, Europe, in yeah. European Russia. But, but mm-hmm. outside of Russia, uh, the pagoda of Belgrade was the first. Buddhist temple in Europe. And of course it was also commissioned with assistance from the Yugoslav state. And, you know, uh, the King at the time came to the opening and, yeah. and Kalmyks had a, had a, you know, relatively decent, you know, high position in, in Serbians in Belgrade at the time. Yeah. So, and, but unfortunately a lot of these Kalmyks in Belgrade were then collaborationists. So they left after the second world world war, um, and they left Belgrade. Yeah, and interestingly, the Germans actually destroyed the temple. Um, 
Hmm. It was it was damaged hmm. in the bombing, and then the mm-hmm. Germans kind of just used it as like an ammo dump uh-huh, or something. Okay. It, was, okay. it was bulldozed after the war. And this guy in, who in Belgrade published this book about Genghis Khan, he was, I think, Kalmyk himself. So he was not an ethnic Russian. He was right. a Kalmyk. Kalmyk are like a Mongolian ethnicity, and they're like, yeah. I think, Tibetan Buddhists. I think. Yeah, yeah, they're Tibetan Buddhists. Yeah. Oh, also actually interesting, when uh, when they opened the pagoda in Belgrade, uh, there was financial assistance from the Empire of Japan. Mm. Uh, <laughs> mm. All right. Interesting. Yeah. Is, yeah. So, um, so you, you see, uh, Vilimirovic had a few, like, of these contradictory ideas, like... Um, S- uh, Serbs are like defenders of Europe, but actually they're not even European. They're totally Asian. They're like Buddha. The founder of the Serbian nation <laughs> is basically a Buddha, and he has the Asian capability. But the Croats would agree, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the same time, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also, um, he says that Saint Saba at the same time is also a perfect European, because unlike uh, someone who would be purely Asian, he was not like only a, a like a contemplative figure he was a man of action and this is why he in basically invented nationalism 700 years ago oh um. <laughs> saint saba man of action <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. so serbs are like a perfect synthesis between asia and the west this is his whole so point gal- galaxy brain like <laughs> is not saint saba like famous exactly for like scholarship and not action don't isn't I mean, he the one of the kids state of educators, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, he was yeah. uh, uh, like a man of action, like, I guess, from his perspective, because he did actually found an uh, autonomous church here. Like, uh, so he did things. He didn't just go to the monastery and pray. He like was an active person in uh-huh. politics as well, but like church politics. Um, so we found out that Saint Sava is a Buddha, but you know good, good. who else is like. Uh, like Saint Sava, it's Ooh, wait. Uh, uh, oh mm. man, so many options. He sounds a little bit like Jordan Peterson, as well, like a you know man of activity. Yeah, maybe they're, they're, uh, they're kind of close, cult, but uh, kind of nationalist. No girls. No, um, Adolf Hitler is very much like Saint Sava. Oh, Adolf Hitler. Okay. Okay. So uh, in one according of the... to Nikolai, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so um, in the 30s, after he received the medal from Adolf Hitler, uh, in one of his like lectures, which is like one of the f- like founding documents for his ideology of say Tsava nationalism, he um, he talks about how the West was not um, successful in developing nationalism completely because they never did what the S- S- Serbs did, and that's equated with having a national church. Uh, in a complete way, mm. there are some yeah, they exceptions. He that says, one key. "Yeah, yeah." They're, like he says, there are like some exceptions, like the Anglican Church, which is very close to it. So he he still has like some place in the, his heart for the Anglicans. Um, but then he says, um, "But we need to like honor the like current Führer of the German people, because mm. he like in the common man from the people, he had a realization that nationalism without." A faith or church is an anomaly. It's a it's a cold and um, unsecure, like insecure mechanism. He says something like this. Okay. So and he, Adolf Hitler came to this uh, in the twentieth century to the idea of Saint Sava, and like as a layman, he took upon himself the most important work, uh, the one that's like wor- uh, worthy of a saint, a genius, and a hero. And that's to Hitler create... like straight up hated Serbs, right? Like <laughs> yeah, specifically. But... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. I guess he, you liked saying something. But, but I mean, it's interesting <laughs> if he's looking for, you know, these kind of examples of national churches, why Anglicanism and not any of the other Orthodox churches that maybe don't huh. like Serbia, like the Bulgarian church or something. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, are they not a uh, bit more obvious. national churches? Yeah. Or the Romanians or, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah, absolutely. Any of the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why not? I mean, Bulgarians, especially if you're like into synthesis between Asia and Europe, Bulgarians are pretty much my, by that, no, by like being a, of Turkic origin, who yeah. then like uh, adopted a Slavic culture and language, or like, yeah, yeah. But no, it's the Serbs uh, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Saint Sava slash Vic, That's what they were doing. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Saint Sava's in the monastery. Fuck yeah, yeah, with Hitler. It's cold. <laughs> 
<laughs> Puts Hitler on says, another, wraps himself in another bear skin and snuggles mm-hmm. on down by the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hitler says, why don't you slip into something more comfortable? And Sava says, nothing's more comfortable than a robe. And then he <laughs> takes it off. Again, steamy. Two other monks suggest yeah. we should huddle for warmth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. What the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> So, yeah, th- this was after he got the medal. Uh, so I guess he wanted to say something nice about Hitler. Um, and uh, not only that, but he compared him to, like, the, the, the best guy ever, Saint Sava. And said that how today he's the only person in the West who's doing what Saint Sava did. Um, so, yeah. And, uh, I mean, uh, for this reason, uh, this is why they didn't really, like, uh, treat him that badly, uh, even though he was against uh, the signing the, 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 the agreement, the pact with the Axis, and worked against it because of his nationalist reasons. After the Nazi occupation of Yugoslavia and Serbia, they didn't really... I mean, they, they, he was interned in a monastery, but they didn't treat him that badly, I think, because they remembered that he's actually their guy. He really likes the Fuhrer. And um, there was also like there was some trial in the 60s in Germany... And uh, I don't exactly know what, what the trial was about, but there was a, like one of the witnesses was a, a guy who was a Nazi agent uh, in Serbia during the occupation. And he said how they were considering, even though he did this like treacherous things with his anti-Axis demonstrations, that they were considering to put him as the head of the Serbian Orthodox Church. The Nazis okay. did. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I wanted to say one more thing about uh, Nikolai Vladimirovich before I briefly talk about something else, but also connected to him. It was this? Uh, he had this idea. I mean, because a lot of these um, uh, like nationalist intellectuals are who are like traditionalist and um, anti-modernity are uncomfortable with themselves in a way because it's a very contradictory position to be a nationalist and then against modernity and nationalism right. are purely modern project so they had to come up with a lot of ideas how to overrun that and so one was this example that i said uh, how he said actually saint sava was the original nationalist but then there is a guy who like i mentioned earlier in like one of the early episodes when we talked about the development of serbian national project which was called dosite obradovic and who was like a, like an uh, like a an guy who lived in the late 18th century, early 19th century, an enlightenment guy. I call him like one of the rare Serbian guys who wore a wig. So, you right. can, yeah. Uh, so he, yeah. And he, he was like, he, you, we could call him like a legitimately, like the father of the Serbian nation in the sense that he was the, in, the ideologue of the uprisings against the Turks. And when the first Serbian state was formulated, he was the first minister of like, education, and he was wrote the program of the Serbian s- s- national building um, and was informed by a lot of these Enlightenment ideas. But these people, like, hate him because he was, a, a, like, a pro-Western guy who brought all of these Western ideas. But, I mean, the problem... And he was also very anti-clerical, right? I mean, he, he really, was... Yeah. yeah, this is, like, why they, why they hate him. But, like, this is a problem because he, he brought the Western idea of nationalism to Serbia. So, mm, right. but they are nationalists, but they hate him, you know. So they want... Saint, <laughs> they desperately okay. want Saint Sava to be their father, but it's really those, you know, the city. <laughs> um, and, and so they, he, he make, makes a kind of interesting comparison because uh, Dosite Obradovic was also a monk, you know, and he, the Sita is actually his monastic name. Uh, mm-hmm. he, his original name was Dimitri. But he, uh, what he did was he ran, well, he, he was a young monk, and then he ran away from the monastery and went to the West, got an education, and then came back uh, as an old man. Uh, so, and so you see, Saint Sava did the opposite thing. He was an aristocrat who ran away from his family and the court into a monastery. Mm-hmm. Because he desperately wanted mm-hmm. to be a monk, <laughs> so they say how this is like a Serbian history is like a, 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 marked by these two events. You know, Saint Sava running to the monastery and the city running away from the monastery. Oh, okay. and, uh-huh. So yeah, so this is in a way like the bad influence, like the Westernization of Serbia. Although that's basically the start of the national project in Serbia. You know, yeah, right. but this is like. 
They really Dos are. Dos not our daddy. You're our daddy now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, that's uh, Nikolai Vladimirovich, the bishop and the saint, apparently. Uh, I don't know exactly why. I mean, it, it was uh, 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 so the thing with the the movement that he was uh, placed to be ahead of the Bogomolci. That their thing was that they were not drinking or not smoking, not doing anything like that. Oh, boo! Uh, yeah, they were barely ba- barely eating. Um, but the thing that like Nikola Vladimirovich was a smoker, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and so uh, when he was uh, about to be proclaimed uh, this, uh, a saint, then the the, the patriarch had a problem with it because of the smoking. Like, he had second thoughts oh God, because he okay. knew that Nikolai was a smoker. Like, he didn't, like, the, the, the horrible anti-Semitic things, like praising Hitler, <laughs> comparing him to Saint no, Sava. No, 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 the smoker. No, like, yeah. You know. um, yeah. Uh, Funny people. But that's interesting, Polite though, because, society. I mean, mm. uh, Orthodox monks are kind of famously luscious, right? I mean, they, mm. they make rakia, they make brandy, yeah, they yeah. make the wine... Yeah. You know, they but the, that patriarch uh, back then in the early 2000s, the, the monk, you know, yeah, he was very <laughs> against those things. But patriarch Pavel, he was um, a guy who was very Puritan, I guess. He had a big problem with that. Like a saint who's a smoker, he thought that's preposterous. But he, in, in the end, agreed. <laughs> So I wanted to talk uh, in the end about something a bit different, but uh, all very connected to this as well. And this is that the, in the, about the same time, the 30s, there was another fascist circle, uh, but this time of intellectuals. I think Nikola Vilimirovich also tried to have some influence there. So he sent his buddy, Dmitry Nadanovich, the one who he ordered to become the member of his board, also to this crew. So he also wrote, because this was primarily a magazine called Idea, Ideas, so mm-hmm. his body also wrote there, but the influence was not crucial there because this was they were already like you know smart asses like intellectuals, mm-hmm. so they had their own ideas. And the so Croatian the, version of that one is called Konzum, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. That's a, a joke that a lot of our <laughs> listeners will get. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Um, the guy who started today, who was the main editor of the magazine, was Miloš Crnjanski. So a lot of people might know who this is. I mean, Serbs, Croats, Yugoslavs know. He's the guy who's considered to be, like, by some people, maybe the greatest uh, Serbian writer of the 20th century, uh, the novelist, like, together with Ivo Andrić. And, like, usually when they talk about Yugoslav novelists, usually they name... Like Ivo Andrić, Tranjanski, and Krleža as the three of the most important ones. But what is um, not so much uh, known about Tranjanski was that he was a fascist. Um, so he, uh, it's kind of unknown because, um, unlike so many other Yugoslav fascists, he was allowed. He was not a collaborator during the Second World War. He had his fortune not to live. Uh, in Yugoslavia during the occupation, so he didn't like dishonor himself in such a way, um, and he was quite well known uh, writer. So he was allowed by the Yugoslav socialist authorities to come back to Yugoslavia. I think in the maybe early sixties. I'm not sure exactly when he came back, but he was a very respected figure. Got a pension. His books were published, and he was like rehabilitated so. in life. Somehow. Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. I mean, because for the Yugoslav communists, the most important thing for many of them was that you were not a collaborator. Uh, right. This is like the thing that you would probably get shot for. But if you like... Uh, or or get your job back as a cop. Uh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you, are, if you are a fascist in the 30s, um, but were not a collaborator and also you are a famous writer, uh, then you could get a pension. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is an interesting like uh, group because uh, it's an intellectual kind of cultural journal, um, and uh, it shows uh, how much how many intellectuals and like bourgeois people were into fascist stuff in general, like in Europe in the thirties, but also in Yugoslavia. Um, so. Um, they are all kind of, like there are different fascist currents represented here in these different intellectuals, uh, but uh, so so this uh, as I mentioned, this uh, friend of Vilemirovich also writes the, uh, their their idea about Saint Sava and uh, everything that we mentioned so far. Um, but uh, the thing that they really uh, write a lot about is this 
cultural Bolshevism and how much they're against it. And as, as I said, I think they think of it as a, the most destruct, destructive form of communism. Um, and, they, uh, and they define it as Jewish influence in philosophy, literature, uh, <laughs> art. Um, and they also, I think, say how it produces uprooted cosmopolitans. So, I mean, this is interesting how much this is very current. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the absolutely. way that today, you know, the alt right would uh, talk. I mean, um, okay, alt right, maybe that's even um, a passe term. But all yeah. of these like um, fascist wannabe intellectuals are kind and of even have even the same Maya story. Had this kind of thing. It was uh, yeah, 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 something very similar to this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, this is an, like a completely different group from the the trend that I mentioned so far. Like for example, these Bogomolci, like this religious poor people these are like the Jesus, um, uh, the, the Jesus freaks uh, they are, these are like a lot of these people are not even religious uh, they're like educated university professors a lot of doctors like medical doctors mm-hmm. uh, writers um, but mm-hmm. they uh, it's I mean it's kind of a, like they they did what the alt-right or the new right want to do to make a respectable intellectual publication and they didn't only publish fascist stuff you know, they they had like a text by some Soviet authors, like uh, you know, so they kind of uh, mix it up a little bit, okay. and then they would uh, they would also include uh, like people who are not necessarily fascist, but who are like uh, modernist writers who are conservative or right wing or something like this. So it looks like a diverse in some way Fair and balanced. publication. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, then what they do, they have a debate on race theory, for example. Oh. <laughs> and and the debate on race theory is not whether we should be racist or not, but which race theory is more correct, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, like, for example, there was, a, like, uh, the biggest debate in the newspaper was a debate between two guys uh, who were both medical doctors, uh, one called Branimir Malish and the other co- guy called Svetislav Stefanovic. And this Stefanovic, he was also a writer, like a modernist writer, a poet, and so on. They were both mm-hmm. medical doctors, and they had a little bit different ideas on race theory. So, like, I think Malish thought that, um, like, blood, um, how do you call them, blood types, are not important for determining who, who is of what race. And True. Stefanovic so, thought that they... I mean- Blood yeah. types, we're talking a, you know, yeah. oh, right, yeah, yeah, okay. Or okay. I, I was actually not sure what they thought. Like, I mean, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but something they called uh, blood groups. Um, uh, or, yeah, they also used the term blood index, which reminded me of the Temple of Blood. Um, <laughs> so blood they, pool. so yeah. this Stefano, which was very much into this blood index and determining who is of what race uh, according to their blood index. Uh, so, but it's interesting that, uh, so, but I mean, this is like a successful fascist project in my sense, like, it w- because they managed to have a debate on race with, on, in, in both sides are racist. I mean, yeah. very much. <laughs> yeah. So this is like, like what you want if you're a fascist, I think. You know, I'm from yeah. America, right? That's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, it's interesting that they uh, how they de- see race is because they um, they thought that uh, that nations are like a mixture of different races, but the, there are like uh, dominant races in uh, each of the nations. So they uh, they use this term of dinaric uh, type, dinaric oh, race, right, right, um, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, dinarska rasa, which is a term that they. Um, used by the 19th century and early 20th century, like ethnographers and geographers from Yugoslavia. One of them is like Cvić, which is the most important one. And today um, by idiots on YouTube. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, th- th- these are the people who like, they say you uh, live in like Dalmatia and Lika and Herzegovina. And it's interesting because a lot of these people who say are part of this type are either Serbs or Croats, even like B- um, Bosniaks. So it's like kind of a Yugoslav, uh, old Yugoslav. Uh, group, okay, which they say is a specific like racial group of like mo- the most superior um, uh, Yugoslavs, um, and they uh, because there, there was a theory by some of these ethnographers from the 19th century, and these race theories adopted that the Dinaric people are the like the uh, the uh, the descendants of the like Serbian aristocracy that didn't want to like submit to the Turks. So they ran into like high mountain tops and lived there as free, you know. Uh, and apparently like, just what? had millions of babies. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so they they do like an analysis of uh, like um, um, uh, medieval Serbian like uh, um, religious paintings of this dynasty that Saint Sava was a part of, uh, called the Nemanjić dynasty, and they de- decide how these are like d- dinaric. Not only that, but they are like Aryan uh, people. Uh, which the for them Aryan is a bl- blonde dinaric type. So uh, like Aryan is basically a subgroup of uh, so the... Slovenians. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and well, the, the Saint Sava in his depictions is not particularly Aryan. No, uh, at all. Actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, what what the fuck is he? I mean, Hitler is not. Yeah. I guess he's also super it, Aryan. I don't it's know. a way of life. It's a belief system about honor and loyalty. Mm. You remember all that shit. Dueling, yeah. right? Come on. And they are very <laughs> much into eugenics. So they think that the state That's should yeah. um, like uh, take care of the racial hygiene of a nation. That's the term they use. Uh-huh. And yeah. so the, the the guy that I mentioned, the Trnia, Miloš Crnjanski, the writer, who was the main editor, he was also extremely pro-war. Uh, he was like, in that sense, kind of um, uh, compar- comparable to Ernst Junger, like some of his writings in the same time in the Germany. Uh, so he thought, he wrote how the, you know, the, the a war is like a, a biological cleansing of a nation or something like this. How yeah, this is good. Yeah. You know, King um, Alexander also had this idea of the uh, political hygiene uh, oh, oh, of communities. Yeah, it, it was all about hygiene in mm-hmm. the 30s. Yeah, yeah. Um, except for actually Nikola Vilimirovich, he was against hygiene. He specifically, <laughs> I mean, he looks it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, when he wrote, uh, he, when he became uh, like a conservative and anti-Western, he wrote text specifically against hygiene, how, uh, how, how, how the Western decadent culture is like obsessed with hygiene and bathing all the time. And he apparently yeah, like yeah, right. yeah. he they say he had a smell like um, so mm. wait he was like an original crust lord of, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> also he's got that vibe he's got the beard he needs like a he needs like a beaver tail like uh, one single dreadlock <laughs> uh, remind me how the uh, the last patriarch died and um, if I'm not mistaken uh, the last uh, died the co- coronavirus the previous one yeah. coronavirus and if I'm not mistaken they all lined up to kiss him and then got coronavirus yeah. Yeah, yeah, hygiene's not I a big the, deal in the Orthodox Church. No, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. I mean, actually, it was. That's that. That's a different tangent. But there was a point in in, in the nineteenth century where they were super hardcore about ad- adopting like hygiene standards. Uh-huh, okay, and they actually banned the kissing of corpses in really? the nineteenth century. What the fuck happened to, to that? do it in the twenty first? That was a good idea. Yeah. God damn it! Yeah. So it's kind of a reg- regression there. Yeah. Thanks, Vladikovic. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they had also, uh, talking about eugenics in this journal, they had different ideas about it. So obviously you shouldn't mix with other races, but sometimes they think it's okay. So it's okay when Slavs and Germans mix, but surprisingly, <laughs> or maybe not, it's also okay when Slavs and Mongols mix. They think that's a good thing. Like, uh, uh, okay. so, Which is, I guess, very surprising. Like the Hungarians, but probably, I guess. Yeah, probably that's also the influence of these Eurasians that I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. It's called Positive yeah, right. View of Genghis Khan. Yeah. So, yeah. Then Although, I ask I mean, again, this, um, who were the Serbs defending Europe from? Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. No. Like, Serbs are defending Europe from uh, a lesser people who are also superior people. Ah, oh. And... The, and allowing for the West to develop into, into the worst civilization that ever existed. So, sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. So they kind of it was like a Christ-like. They, <laughs> the, the Serbs kind of sacrificed themselves mm. so that the West could live, and then they became ungrateful bastards. Ah, uh, mm. okay. Something like that, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. But I, because well, they why? spent centuries suffering mm. to protect them, and then they become spoiled brats. Yeah. But why even protect them if you know if Serbs are more Asian and they have the Asian capability and Saint Sava is a kind of a Buddha. So why protect and Genghis Khan is also super cool. So why protect West from that then? I don't know. Because I mean, the other ter- <laughs> the other Mongol <laughs> Mongolian people coming from the other side were not Buddhists and that's the problem. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I think you cracked it. I mean Maybe if uh, yeah, know, it Sultan all makes Murad sense. was yeah. 
was a, was a Buddhist, then you know, it would be a different story. I mean, none of these make sense. Like, um, <laughs> I mean, always when you like deal with nationalism, it's always, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you try to... Well, it's found uh, on a it foundational contradiction of of modern traditional modernist traditionalism. I mean. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and fascism is basically. I mean, this is also why I think you can't really divorce completely nationalism from fascism. I think fascism is just like a, like a specific development of nationalism that yeah. happened in a certain period, but it's basically a kind of nationalist movement. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, national and socialist. You can and also see it in all these contradictions. How much yeah. of a nationalist movement it is, but this this kind of thing that um, about like well certain like strong races can intermix is actually something you see in some of the like Latin American uh, fascist movements later like Serrano I think Miguel Serrano mm-hmm. believed that like Chileans were like the best mix of Europe like mm. con- like you know conquistador Spanish blood and like the Mapuches and like the who were like the strongest of the Indians, right? Mm-hmm. Or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Synthesis. And that like makes them kind of, you know, like. Yeah. Old yes, Rano, who, ideal who also race. lived in Yugoslavia in the 60s, by the way. Um, yeah. But as an ambassador yeah. of Chile. <laughs> but of course. <laughs> I mean, maybe it would just be like worth mentioning kind of the, um, the general kind of atmosphere in Yugoslavia at the time. Like, I mean, or. Like, you know, why were they so preoccupied with cultural Bolshevism? I mean, because mm, yeah. it was a real threat, right? I mean, it was a very unstable time. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit before, but I think it's good to reiterate that because it can look like it's kind of like a bubble, right? We're talking about these people who are preoccupied with these things, but why? <laughs> why? Because, you know, it was pretty clear that the country was going to fall apart in some way or another and it was either going to disintegrate kind of on national lines or it was going to you know have some sort of bolshevik inspired <laughs> revolution you want to say something about it i mean you kind of just did i kind of <laughs> just did i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. i mean yeah i mean the, the of course i mean um you know in uh, 1920 the just founded the Communist Party of Yugoslavia elected like uh, the mayors of the two biggest cities, like Belgrade and Zagreb. They, they were communists. They were never allowed to become actual mayors. Also, a few other cities. Then there was like a, an anti-communist law which banned uh, the Communist Party. Then some communists killed the Minister of Interior. Uh, so a bunch of them were like uh, arrested. Like the, the Das Kapital was translated in prison, you know, because they were very organized and they managed to mm. wow. organize the communists in prison, even some kind of schools for themselves in prison. Yeah, this, this, this is interesting, and we'll talk about this later in the Ustash episode, but yeah. the communists were, like, very well organized in prison specifically. Yeah. And that was also where they were imprisoned with some certain nationalists, and in some cases kind of converted them. There were a couple cases of guys that were locked up as Croatian nationalists came out as communists and this and the other thing because yeah. i think communists kind of ran the prisons at the time <laughs> uh, uh, interesting yeah i mean uh, it was a big organization and a lot of conservatives and liberals but mostly conservatives and especially fascists were very afraid of it um and because i mean it had close connections to the soviet union obviously uh so there was a lot of panic about marxism and communism in the 30s yeah So, okay, yet another episode about some fucking freak who turned into a fascist uh, yep. and didn't bathe. So cool. Mm. <laughs> you know, add that one <laughs> to the list. Some wild-eyed wizard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nikolai Velimirovich, uh, mm. keep him up in your noggin. You can, yep. you know, fight him if you got your fash Pokemon game on. Gandalf ass looking motherfucker. Well, uh, unlike a lot of people that we talked so far uh, about when we talked about Western Nazis, this is not a marginal figure in society. Oh, right. Um, yeah. No, it is, it is today yeah. quite revered. The yep. current uh, patriarch just recently said something about how he's one of the three most important Serbs in yeah, history yeah. or something him. like this. Yeah. 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 Do you think he would have been this revered if he didn't die in exile? I mean, there's this kind of 
how you die is really important. It is. It is pretty yeah. important, Probably so. not. I mean, but he didn't die. Like he wasn't a martyr, really. Like he wasn't. He wasn't killed by communists. So I don't, I'm not sure exactly where the whole idea that he's a saint comes from. He might be a martyr mm. in the future. You don't know. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Yeah. I mean, there was a, there were there was after the war there was um, an association of Orthodox priests which was like anti-fascist and probably controlled by the state. And they really hated Nikolai Velimirovich in the 50s. Mm. They, they were like literally wrote a text in which they literally say that he is a shit. Like, oh, uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> and this is like a, a text by the you know, Association of Orthodox Priests, you know. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> there's another difference. If anybody's wondering yeah. about why they're different from Catholics, yeah. it's another difference. Yeah. 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 They're allowed to say bad words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're allowed to do all sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, Mary. Yeah. yeah, I think that's why they liked the Anglicans because they were like the party Catholics. Yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's that's enough. All right. Well, so we're gonna go into uh, Croatian fascism next. Uh, stick around. And, uh, stick around. It is and also uh, hop on Twitter. <laughs> you know, follow us on Twitter. Share our Hit shit. That like button. Just uh, do some like social media stuff for us. It's terrible. Desperate to help us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please. What's it like? What's his name? The guy uh, Bush's brother. Please clap. Which Jeb? Jeb. Yeah. Please clap. Please like. Subscribe. Please.